So, uh, yeah, so today we're going to, for our last lecture, talk about um, some of the more advanced topics um, as we get kind of towards the end of summer here, you know, we'll start thinking about, you know, if we have a, a new planting, you know, how is it doing? Are there things that we need to think about for management down the road? And um, what we'll be talking about today will be kind of how we go about doing that and um, talking about some of this, um, some of the techniques and the resources we can use um, to do seedling ID and related to that, conducting a stand assessment. And then we'll also be uh, covering some of the, um, one of the things that uh, you all uh, indicated that you'd like to learn about, which, uh, which are uh, plant ID apps. And so we're gonna look at those. Um, I, I put those through a very, uh, <laughs> Put them through the ringer, and we'll 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 show you how how well they did. So, um, looking forward to that. Okay. So um, again, our goals for today: we want to um, make uh, sure we're we... not sharing your screen. Sorry to interrupt. Thanks, Andy. Um, share this one. And there we go. Doing better. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. So, um, so today uh, we'll be, uh, so again, our, our learning goals for today we want to uh, talk through some of the uh, resources we have for seedling ID. Um, just talk about seedling ID in general, um, some tips and tricks and how it's different than uh, the things we've learned so far. Um, we'll talk about um, uh, some guides uh, in particular. Um, we'll talk about why we need to do stand assessment or why it's useful. And we'll talk about kind of a quick and dirty um, technique that, uh, that you can follow along with to, uh, to do a stand assessment um, on a prey strip. And then we're going to talk about plan ID app accuracy and some topics on that. So we're going to be covering three plants of the day today, um, and they are all um, a combination of uh, mostly mid to late, so even fall blooming species. So some of these, um, we're not expect to see these for a couple months, but we will show you how you can identify them as seedlings uh, right now. Okay. So... <clears throat> talking about seedling ID here. So um, contrast to other plant ID, um, what makes seedling ID particularly challenging is that, well, because they're such small plants, they're, they really only have one, two, maybe a couple leaves, including their cotyledons to go off of. Um, they're tiny you know, we're, we're talking, you know, less than a couple inches tall. So that means that we have very few characters to go on. Um, talk about, you know, luckily a lot of the characters that are not visual still remain in the seedling. So that can be helpful to, um, to work from. Um, probably the most challenging thing is that you have to look for them. They're just, you don't, unlike plant identification um, with larger plants, with flowering plants especially, um, it, they kind of catch your eye. So you are drawn to figure out what they are. Here we're, we actually have to actively search for them in the ground, you know, right on the ground, on our hands and knees, pushing aside the vegetation that's above them. And um, it really is a different kind of experience uh, than we've done so far, where we've kind of just um, approached things at, um, you know, whatever we've come across. So, so we're going to have to actively search for these things. And then we'll talk about, since we're actively searching, we're making a concerted effort to find things. That means we have to think about a way to make that systematic um, and uh, 
kind of um, try to avoid bias and make some uh, assessments about um, stands based on the seedlings. So um, again, thinking about these seedlings and identifying seedlings, a lot of the things we've talked about so far, you probably didn't really need a hand lens. Maybe there are a couple floral structures that we had to really zoom in on to see. Um, but pretty much every everything requires hand lenses um, for what we're going to be working on um, with the seedlings. So, um, so again, if, hopefully you've uh, picked one up uh, at the start of the course. But um, again, they're quite cheap. You don't need anything much more than uh, seven or around 10, 10x. So, so that's um, that's going to be very helpful when you're doing seedling ID. And then careful fingers. You know uh, these. You know these are tiny, tiny little plants. And for some of the characters, we still have to use our fingers and touch and um, our other senses. So um, let's talk about the resources we have available. So we've sort of established that seedling ID is tough. Um, you know, it's hard. It's a hard thing to do. There's not a lot of characters to go on. These, the way that seedlings look are often completely different than the way the plants look. So, you know, how do we, how do we go? How do we identify this stuff? So um, luckily, uh, there are a couple resources out there for prairie plants specifically. Um, and I will go through, I, I think these are the three um, key sources, at least for Iowa. Um, but the, they're, two of them are free and one of them are not. Um, but we will be working through um, the last one for most of our work. But let's talk about these first two, these, uh, these free guides here. So first one is um, published by the NRCS um, and US, uh, USDA NRCS. And so this, uh, this is a free PDF you can find online. You can get a hard copy, but they like they run like 20 bucks. It's literally just a little um, flip. Um, it's nothing special. So if you can download the PDF from NRCS, that's definitely the way to go. Um, so what does this look like? So this is um, a sample of the guide. Um, so you can see that it's a uh, Got some pictures of seedlings, um, only a few. Um, does have pictures of the adult plant. Um, doesn't really have seedling characteristics per se. Um, so it can be a little challenging to just use the pictures. Um, and one thing we didn't quite uh, look at was the table of contents and the an amount of species that this uh, little guide covers. And it, it covers the basics. Um, well, it covers a, lot, a fairly basic amount of, of plants. Um, there are some important ones it does not cover. Um, some of the important grasses are not in there. Um, so this one is um, a good guide, but it is not really complete, I wouldn't say, for uh, going on doing a stand assessment. Our next uh, resource here is um, this guide here. This is the Prairie Seedling and Evaluation Guide um, published by Stantec and the Iowa Department of Transportation. And again, this is another free um, resource, at least in PDF format, um, I think. I'm not sure. I think the Living Roadway Trust Fund um, uh, provides free copies of this at um, some events. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of times you can pick up a hard copy of this at a um, variety of conferences in um, in Iowa. But again, it's a free PDF and it's a good way to to use the guide. Um, and this one is um, a little bit. Uh, so it's got really good information, has nice, um, nice approach to each species. Um, it does have 
distinct seedling descriptions. And, and, and it's nice that they have a lookalike section, which is very important for seedlings. Um, I would say that the downside to this guide is the really small pictures um, and not very high resolution. So while the, uh, while the text is good, you don't really have a corresponding um, picture to work from. So you get a general sense of the seedling, but um, you can't really see the details, which uh, as we'll learn is really important. Okay, so the last um, resource that we'll be talking about um, is the uh, Thalgrass Prairie Center Guide to Seed and Seedling Identification in the Upper Midwest. Um, that was uh, written by <clears throat> Dave Williams and uh, back in 2012, I think, um, and published by the University of Iowa Press. This one is not free. You can buy copies, hard copies or uh, ebook uh, formats uh, from the University of Iowa Press websites. It's also available on Amazon and other places where you buy, can buy books. And um, last time I checked, which is like last week, it's uh, 14 bucks. So it's relatively affordable. And we will be using this guide to uh, work through our plants of the day and um, we'll show you how this guide works. Okay so let's talk about um, our first plant of the day. Uh, so uh, so this is kind of a, a typical scene that you might see in a first year planting. Um, this I believe was taken around 4th of July um, at one of our uh, prairie strips projects um, in Grundy County. And we can see, you know, it's kind of a mess. You know, it's not a very attractive looking stand, um, but I think, you know, as we learned, there's a lot more going on underneath the surface than uh, meets the eye. So we're going to zoom in and see does, you know, it looks bad, but is it actually, is it actually struggling? So we're going to take a closer look. So we see, uh, once we actually get down to the ground level, start looking, we see all kinds of seedlings. So in this tiny little patch of dirt, there's three seedlings here. Um, there's a grass, there's in two forms. So um, where do we start with these? Um, can we figure out what these plants are? They're so small. They have, you know, one of these plants only has like about three leaves. The grasses are tiny. They're a couple inches tall at most. And, um, and so, you know, where do we start? So this is where we uh, bust out our seedling ID guide. Um, so this is the uh, front matter. So, so this seedling ID guide is structured a lot like similar to Newcomb's guide in that it is based on keys, dichotomous keys that lead you to um, sort of a range of possibilities that you can find, you can sort of uh, narrow down towards the end to get to uh, plausible species identification. So, that's one of the reasons that we use Newcombs as a botany beginner's resource is because it's very user friendly. It's easy to pick up quickly, and it it covers the sort of core concepts of using a dichotomous key, learning to look for botanical um, information in these plants. And so, so we're going to use a lot of what we've learned with Newcombs to apply in this new guide here. I think you'll. You'll notice that it is, um, you know, has fairly similar, um, fairly similar approach. So we're going to start with our first question, which is, um, we want to know if the seedling has a stem or it's just a basal cluster of leaves. So we're going to focus on uh, this plant here and take a look. 
certainly we have a stem and we have stem leaves even, even though it's a tiny seedling, we do have stem and leaves. So we have a stem present. So we're going to go to step two. So we don't have the specimen with us, but if we did roll the stem between our fingers, we would find that it was round. So we're going to go to step three. So here's where um, we're going to encounter some botanical terms. And this is absolutely where we must have uh, hand blunts. So we're going to be looking for the stipules near the base of the petiole or the leaf stalk, if you recall. Uh, talked about uh, the, some of the botanical terminology from Newcombs. And so we're going to have to take a real close look. So these are the stipules. Um, these are the uh, leafy appendages near the base of the leaf um, where the, it meets the stem. And in this particular example, we do have stipules. We can see them here, two very thin sort of hair-like stipules. So we're going to go to step four. Okay, so we've already determined that these are uh, fairly hair-like stipules. They don't look like many leaves. So that means we're going to head to um, our characteristic group one, and that is on page four of the um, guide. Okay, so here is our page four. Um, so let's see here. We are looking that's, uh, sorry, I just, uh, if, um, let's see, Jackson is, is watching. Can you turn your vol volume down? I can, uh, I'm getting some feedback in my office. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, so we're talking about uh, this particular seedling here. Um, and uh, to try to match the, um, try to match the general um, appearance of this uh, seedling to our, um, our, our options here. So if we kind of look at the uh, different seedlings that we have available um, to compare against, definitely doesn't look like a lead plant. It's got much rounder leaves. Um, Jersey tea, definitely not. Very round leaves as well. Purple prairie clover dough. That's definitely pretty good. Uh, looks like a pretty good match. It's got these very thin, um, narrow uh, leaflets. So let's take a look at this. So if we bring up our, um, we went to that page, thumbing through the guide to find purple prairie clover. Um, we can verify uh, whether that seedling is what we're looking at. So again, we have the hair-like stipules, we have alternate leaves, and that compound leaf with three to five leaflets. So that's a very uh, good indication that that's what we're, we're working with. So I think we can um, call this one purple prairie clover. So, um, other common names of this species, um, violet prairie clover. Um, it's, very, it's a very short plant, even when it's uh, fully grown, it doesn't typically get more than three feet tall. Um, and it's a, uh, it's a tap-rooted perennial, um, sometimes comes up in clumps that we see often. Uh, and this is probably its peak flowering time um, in Iowa. So now's a great time to go out and look for the adult version of this. Um, but if you're looking for seedlings, you probably need to go to a, a new planting, a first year planting to find those. So let's, uh, let's look at a second plant. Okay, so this is a pretty typical sort of a view of a, what a prey strip might look like this time of year. Um, now that we're getting uh, towards the end of July, often the um, weeds are getting quite large. And so we have um, 
we've mowed. And so this is a example of a prairie that has been mowed and um, we can see that there's some uh, cover crops still in there. Um, and then there's just a lot of vegetation, small plants that are here and there. So um, it looks like we still have the option to um, take a closer look at the seedlings because they have not been mowed. Uh, the mower deck does not reach that low. So here, here's our, our seedling that we're going to identify. So again, we're going to go back to our um, initial part of the key. Um, so we're going to start with number one again. So this time we want to look at whether the stem is a basal cluster of leaves or has a stem. So this looks like pretty much a basal cluster of leaves. So um, we're going to go to stem absent. So we want to go to six and ask whether this is a grass-like seedling and is definitely not grass-like. It's very uh, wildflower or forb looking. So that means we want to try page 49 and look through group six. So group six is a pretty extensive uh, group. So we'll just kind of take it as it comes. So kind of, again, just comparing what we have um, in our picture to the pictures of the seedlings and, uh, and investigating further if we think we might have a match. So uh, our first look here is Black Eyed Susan. Um, doesn't really appear to be a good match. It's got, uh, looks like a lot more hairs than what we have. Um, the bottle gentian definitely does not look like what we have. Canada anemone, very different. Compass plant, definitely, it's only got one leaf. That's not what we're looking at. Boxglove beard tongue, that doesn't quite seem to match. Coneflower, much more erect than what we have in our picture. Golden Alexander. Um, these just don't really look like good matches here. So can we find one that does have a good match to what we're um, working with? Well, um, I think if we finally get to towards the end of the page, there is something that looks like it would be a good a candidate to check out. So the smooth blue aster is, uh, is looking pretty similar to what we have in our um, in our stand. So let's take a look. Okay, so yeah, we have a basal leaf cluster <clears throat> and uh, looks like one of the key characters is that the leaf margin extends to the plant base. So let's see, do we have that? Yeah, we definitely have that. So our leaf margin goes all the way to the base on all of our leaves. So, so that's a good sign that we have the correct ID. Um, and we also have smooth, uh, we have some, some and um, we can also see, probably not in this picture, but if we got our hand lens out, we'd see some hairs along the margin of the leaf. We can also see that there's quite a few lookalikes, right? There's four lookalikes. Um, and this will uh, this guide will help us figure out um, why they, you know, if we think we might have a uh, smooth blue aster uh, and we don't actually, this this will help us uh, confirm or deny whether we do have smooth blue aster. So um, if we had a, Old field goldenrod, we'd have rough leaves. Um, if it was showy goldenrod, we'd have different kind of leaf venation. Um, sneeze weed would have the widest part of the bay of the leaf blade um, near the middle, so you would have less of an egg shape and more of a um, lance shape or a, a obvate, uh, uh, ovate shape. Sif goldenrod, uh, we wouldn't have that leaf margin that extended to the plant base. So, so those are some of the 
traits that we can use from the guide to just double check and uh, confirm that this is a smooth blue aster. So uh, that is our second plant of the day, smooth blue aster. Um, fair, again, a fairly medium sized plant, um, three feet tall. It's a short rhizominous perennial. So a lot of the time you'll see it as um, sort of a, a clump or a small cl cluster. Um, and this is this is one of our most um, classic uh, late fall flowering species. So we definitely will not be seeing this one if you go out and start and botanize uh, flowering. It, you know, you you could spot it vegetatively. It has pretty unique, smooth, um, pretty un uh, pretty much uh, not like the other asters that it could be confused for, um, but uh, it is definitely not ready to bloom for quite a while now. But it does have these really nice purple um, flowers, purple pink that uh, uh, sort of similar, a little less uh, deep purple than um, New England aster, which is another fairly common prairie species that uh, you might find in a brace strip. So I'm going to take a break here and um, see if anybody's got a question uh, about what we've covered so far. Do we have anything in the chat? Nothing so far for questions. Well, if we don't have anything additional, we can uh, keep moving on um, into our second module here. We do have one, one, one question came in. It's yep. a short one. Uh, is it possible to roll the stem without harming the seed? No, <laughs> not really. So usually if you're going to roll the stem with a seedling, you'll have to take it out of the ground. Um, like larger seedlings, you sometimes can do that without you know, having to um, pluck it. But some of that stuff is uh, really, I mean, we're talking teeny tiny, um, very, uh, very small characters that I don't even barely be able to get it in between your fingers, but you can do it and it does, uh, you can feel those uh, edges if they're there. Question, I think that's, I think that's it for now. Okay, all right. So, so we move on to our, our next topic here, stand assessment. So I, I would say this really goes hand in hand with seedling ID. Um, I mean, there's many kinds of stand assessments that we could do in mature strips, establishing strips. Um, it's a very broad term, but what we'll be kind of covering today is um, the need to do stand establishment early and uh, basing it on some uh, seedling ID. So why... Why do we even care about doing a, a, assessing a stand of, of, of prairie strips? Why can't we just kind of take a look at it and, you know, based on our best judgment, say, you know, this looks good, or this looks bad. I see some weeds. Um, we'll treat those, but otherwise, it looks fine. Or, you know, this is a terrible stand. We need to start over. Well, those are um, those are sort of the the things that we want to you know, help make those decisions. And that is what a stand assessment is going to help us do. So um, one of the main benefits of a stand assessment is that it helps us prevent some uh, rash decisions based on its initial appearance. And I can tell you from, you know, working in, or, you know, establishing prairie strips, seeing it the first year, no matter how many times you do see it, it is always disconcerting. 
how bad things look uh, by the end of the first year. There are always tons of weeds. You don't typically see the native stuff um, unless you really look for it. And so it, even with a lot of experience, it's, uh, it's always fairly nerve wracking to go out and, and look at some of these stands that you spent a lot of time coming up with a plan and developing a seed mix and buying the seed mix plant and seeding it. And so there's a lot riding on this um, decision about, or this assessment about whether this um, prairie strip is succeeding or it's not, because that's going to probably, you know, either cost a lot or will uh, save you a lot of money. So having um, a stand assessment, having some results um, to really, you know, that are systematic, based on systematic, um, unbiased um, information helps us, you know, know when to increase our management intensity or uh, increase the weed scouting, um, or it helps us know whether we really do need to reseed or start over. So, um, so having a concrete number, having something to compare against benchmark um, estimates of, of seedling density can definitely help put your mind at ease or kind of give you a, um, a reality check about what this uh, stand is likely to be able to accomplish with respect to you know, long-term ecological goals. Um, so, Again, early detection can help save a lot of money in the long run. You know, if we if you detect low seedling density, if you don't have a lot of native plants, that could open up some opportunities to supplement that through some um, supplemental seeding um, before perennial weeds colonize that space and um, become an issue to the extent that you know, you need to restart and, you know, destroy the vegetation that, you know, you did, you know, uh, put in there. So um, trying to come up with some, some early, uh, early management options is always going to save uh, money in the long run. Okay. So what, what are we talking about when we talk about a, a stand assessment and what, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about samples and sampling? So um, generally speaking, the basic steps for an assessment or a sampling protocol um, is going to have kind of three parts. Um, first one is sort of the planning stage where you're trying to figure out um, the quantity, location, layout, timing of, of when you're going to do samples. Um, and then you're going to collect the samples and then use uh, those samples to calculate some summary statistics and compare that to some, some benchmarks. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about that first step here. So we'll talk about how we would, uh, some of the things to consider in, in stand assessment with that. So, um, so, uh, so we have, a, so for a sample quantity, generally more is better, but there's this trade-off between, you know, what is, um, uh, able, what, what you can actually do in the time that you have. So you're trying to typically get the fewest samples that you, that you need to answer your questions. Um, 20 to 30 is generally a good place to shoot for. Um, at least statistically speaking, um, but you know, depending on um, your time um, resources, that may need to go uh, lower sometimes. So uh, again, the the real key here is to come up with a systematic way of assessing a stand. So um, what we'll be talking about, we'll be talking about this quick and dirty um, approach where uh, you know not we're not presenting something that's going to give you answers of scientific caliber um, but it will give you a uh, a general uh, systematic and 
relatively unbiased estimate of what you know you have in your spray strip. So when we talk about sampling locations, so we have um, where do we how do we uh, how do we set this up so that we when we do sample the prey strip, where do we do it and uh, why would we put it in a certain place? So um, this is when we're talking about systematic selection of uh, sample locations and certainly for prairie strips, the easiest way to uh, systematically um, locate places to take samples is using a transect. Um, and we'll we'll talk about how you can do that quickly and easily um, in just a second. Um, but, you know, in an ideal world, if you're doing something um, scientifically, you'd want to try to do it randomly. Um, so we won't talk about how to do a random sample or set out a random transect um, because for the purposes of, of simple management, um, it's probably not necessary. Um, so so here's here's a suggestion, a possibility for a quick and dirty um, place to start if you're trying to quickly uh, assess a prey strip. So you can do you could try one transect with temp samples per strip. Um, of course, this is you know a fairly low number of samples to to work with, so you do run the risk of over or under counting, uh, but you're definitely <clears throat> making up for it in speed and typically that means that you're more likely to do it so there's a trade-off there um talking about the layout um you know where does this transect go where should we put it um generally you want to put it away from edges um and uh, you want the transect to intersect the entire strip if possible so sampling at equal intervals um, timing. So when do we want to go out and collect samples for, um, for these types of uh, assessments? Um, early September, sometime in September, typically the best when you have seedlings growing to um, a fairly large size. Sometimes you can even use general vegetative characteristics. They've sort of transitioned into their juvenile um, phase. And so sometimes you don't have to use a seedling ID guide, but certainly there's a lot of seedlings in that first year that remain seedlings. So this uh, waiting until September makes sure that everything that is going to germinate that year probably has. So you're, you're getting a, a good estimate of what's out there. Okay, so, so how do we, uh, so a quick and dirty application of, of, of layout, transect layout, um, would be to use pace distances and uh, Google Maps to generate transects. So um, we're going to do that real quick. So I'll show you how to do that easily with Google Maps. So let me bring up this. I'm going to see if I can't screen a different screen. There. Everyone should be able to see this. So, this browser. So, I've just brought up Google Maps, and we're going to look at a prairie strip project that is actually where we're going to be doing our field day on Friday. And so, we're going to actually just see how you would set up a quick and dirty transect for one of the prairie strips that we'll be visiting. So. Um, we're going to look at this prairie strip here. I don't know if I hope you can see my um, you can cursor. see your cursor. Yep. Okay. Good. So, so basically, what we want to do is use Google Maps to determine the um, determine the length of the prairie strip, um, and basically divide it by ten so that we can come up with um, an equal distance, and then figure out. What are, what is our pace distance to figure out how how many paces do we want to walk down the middle of the strip to um, before we set up a, a sample? 
So we will um, go and show you how to measure easily on Google Maps. So um, on Windows machines, you can uh, right click. Um, I think you can right click on here. And at the very bottom, there's this option for measure distance. So that's gonna basically set a point uh, down for us in Google Maps. And we can basically uh, just select our spot that we want um, to measure. And so we can kind of move this around if we need to, to set our transect uh, more or less down the middle of this one. So this is about 980 feet. So um, we're going to keep that in mind. So if we divide 980 by 10, that means bring bring our So, um, so here's where you want to, so, uh, let's put down, this is a different strip actually than I uh, initially came up with numbers where I'm gonna have to do this in my head as we go. Um, so, so typically, you know, you'd have to, you'd wanna measure your own uh, stride step, um, so, but a lot of, um, a lot of people are between two, um, two and a quarter and two and a half uh, feet per stride. So, um, so what we'd want to do is come up with uh, how many strides between uh, nine. Really, we are going to. Uh, calculator is not working right now so we will uh we'll have to uh put this off for the recorded version um and little technical difficulties here with those uh get that calculation going so um so we're going to move on and we'll uh, make sure to uh, uh add in a slide to uh, show those calculations um for the recording um Okay, so, so let's move on to, um, once we do have the, uh, the transect set up, um, we've got our uh, paces that we need to, to go uh, each, uh, to, to take each uh, uh, sample in, we need to figure out how to, uh, what, what, are we, what are we gonna sample? So um, typically this is where we talk about uh, quadrat. So that's, we're obviously measuring vegetation, um, and we're probably going to be measuring seedling density. Um, definitely helps to focus only on the plants that you've seeded in your seed mix, um, mostly because uh, it uh, really narrows things down, it speeds things up. And those are the most important things that we're uh, interested in. So especially when we're talking about prairie strips going in after agriculture, um, intensive agriculture, there's nothing there. Uh, that remains that's going to establish on its own that's going to do too much to contribute to a long-term um, ecologically uh, sound community. So usually we want to just be focusing on the seedlings that we've uh, uh, seeded. Okay, so um, going back to quadrats. So um, generally speaking, if we're looking at seedlings, smaller is better. Um, often get uh, overwhelmed if you have a large quadrat and you're trying to do seedlings. So keep it around a square foot. Um, and uh, the easiest way to do that uh, is to use uh, PVC tubing. So if you took a 42 and a half inch piece of PVC tubing, secured it end to end in a circle, that would give you uh, about a square foot of area to uh, count seedlings in. So if you put that on the ground, counted all the seedlings, identified them um, in that tube area, 
that will be your sample. So that kind of uh, leads us into what does what what uh, how do you enter that data? That's where data sheets come in. Um, this is an example of one of those data sheets. Um, so this would be something you could uh, use. Very simple to uh, to work off of. Um, if you were to do this quick, quick and dirty approach to uh, stand assessment. Um, but once you've got the data, once you've collected that um, seedling data, that's when you want to do some uh, calculations to uh, figure out what is your seedling density. Um, and it's going to depend on, you know, how large your quadrat was, how um, many samples you took. Um, and so we won't talk too much about uh, those specific calculations. Um, but once you've got the seedling density, that's when you can compare things to the bench to benchmarks. So in general, having less than one seedling per square foot um, is suggestive of a stand that is going to be susceptible uh, to weed invasion. So especially perennial weeds um, like brome and Canada thistle. Um, generally, a uh, prairie uh, strip in the first year will have somewhere between one to four, four being a you know usually a very large success, and one being um, kind of on the on the margins. Um, but uh, generally, two or three; those are one through four seedlings per square foot are. Uh, typical for uh, most of the prairie restorations, at least that uh, I've, I've assessed. So. Um, so if we were looking at our quick and dirty example, the way to calculate seedling density would be to add up all the seedlings uh, that we found and then divide them by 10. And that would give us a, a number of seedlings per square foot for our prairie strip. Uh, so using that information, that will help put our mind at ease or make us consider whether you know we should recede if we have less than a seedling per square foot, um, certainly after the second growing season. Um, but uh, first can help you uh, think about what kind of things uh, are coming. So let's see, looking at the time, I'm going to skip this plant of the day. Um, because we still have quite a bit of work to do talking about um, plant ID apps. So, um, so let's talk about plant ID apps um, for, um, you know, if we were to use plant ID apps for, you know, prairie strip plant identification and management, what are some of the things that we want to consider? Are they useful? Those are the kinds of questions we're going to look at here. So in general, um, the plant ID apps out there now, there's a lot of them. Um, they're available on Apple and Google Play app stores um, for mobile devices. Um, as far as I know, the ones that I looked at all use image recognition software um, to predict what plants are what based on photos that you either take during the use of the app or uh, you can upload them from your uh, your phone's gallery. And these are very appealing because you don't need any botany experience. You can just uh, input a photograph and you'll get a result. So, you know, the downside to that, of course, is that um, you're not really learning very much when you're using them, unlike uh, plant uh, like Newcomb's Guide or uh, the Seedling Guide, where you are sort of learning about the different traits of plants that uh, you know lead to kind of uh, determine what a species identity is, learning the characteristics that uh, contribute to that. Whereas the best you can do with the plant ID apps generally is kind of just learn to recognize the general pattern and shape and color of the, of the plant. So kind of this gestalt recognition is, is about the only thing you can 
learn off of these uh, by using these, uh, uh, at least casually using these um, tools. Um, and again, unlike guides and keys that we've used in the course before, um, the algorithms that are used to make the determination of whether, uh, you know, what species we're looking at is uh, is not human readable. It's, it's um, looking at, it's comparing um, photograph pixel data generally. So it's not something, it's not a set of rules that a human being can read like a dichotomous key. So, and that's even if there's uh, some of the, the apps I think have uh, code available that they use, but generally speaking, it's not even available for anyone to look at. The questions about plan ID apps, I think a lot of people um, ask, and I ask certainly the last one, um, you know, are they accurate? Um, so we're going to look into to that. Um, are they different? You know, are, there's so many of them. Are, are they kind of all the same? Or are there are one, are some better than others? Um, and could their use lead to poor management decisions? So, um, you know, taking a shortcut by using a, a plan ID app to uh, kind of make the plan ID calls for you is definitely appealing. But, um, I, you know, wanted to take a look at if you were to um, base all of your decisions on uh, without botany um, experience and just kind of go off of these apps, would we have issues potentially with uh, management outcomes? So here's what uh, I did. Um, I compared a couple apps um, that are what I thought were probably wide use. Um, a couple of the, most of them are mentioned in best of articles, listicles. Um, tried to make sure that the ones I looked at were available for both Android and iOS. And they had uh, more than a million downloads. Um, so I fed photos from my gallery from real, real plants, real photographs that I took um, in a prairie strip uh, into each of these apps. Um, use the Galaxy S10, and I took photos at my convenience. So I did not respect any of the rules that or suggestions that the apps suggest to you know, uh, maximize their ability to um, get a good ID because that's typically, you know, this was, uh, you know, I had, I didn't have a lot of time to go out and um, like, like anyone doing prey management, you don't have the whole afternoon to, you know, take pictures of every single thing in the perfect light. You just got to go out there, take the pictures that are important, the, the plants that you want, and then go back and, and figure it out um, later. So, so that's the approach I took. So absolutely uh, putting these apps through the ringer. Um, not only did I look at flowering forbs, I looked at grasses that are flowering, I looked at vegetative forbs, vegetative grasses, I even tried seedlings. So this is about as uh, intense of a uh, uh, test that we could do with these, uh, um, these apps. So using that, we, uh, I assessed the accuracy and some of the potential management implications of uh, the results. So um, looked at the percents of um, times it got things correct to species. Uh, the percent that the apps got uh, incorrect answers or provided an incorrect answer. And then the percent of times that the uh, answer res could result in a management blunder. And what I decided that would be would be um, a, a situation where um, the app identified a plant that was native as an invasive species uh, that you might uh, you know, come back and destroy the native plants that you planted or a situation where um, the app identified a um, species, a really, a really bad invasive species like reed canary grass as um, something that was not an invasive species. So kind of the, uh, the separate approach where you, you miss an important management uh, point of uh, uh, intervention. So, so that's what we're talking about with management blunders, the minor blunders being uh, 
the uh, situations where it identifies a native as a usually a long shot invasive species um, or uh, and the serious management blunders as um, identifying something as a serious invasive species that's not or not being able to identify those uh, serious species. So these are the ones we looked at. Um, leaf snap, plant net, picture this, plant snap, seek, Google Lens, and Flora Incognita. Um, so the first couple, these are ranked by the um, their search results from the Google Play Store. Um, so these first four are really, really popular. Leaf snap, plant net, picture this, plant snap. Seek a little less so. Uh, it's also kind of rolled into iNaturalist, I believe. So a lot of people use this um, through the uh, iNaturalist app. Google Lens is not actually a dedicated plant ID app, but it does do it if you ask it to. Um, and there's a kind of a wide variety of developers that are working on these projects. Um, some of them are uh, science-based, like uh, Flora Incognita, um, Seek, and PlantNet are all uh, developed by uh, consortiums of uh, scientific organizations. Um, and uh, so the other ones are software developers um, that are sort of general, general focus. Um, picture this as a uh, developed by a AI image recognition um, focused uh, group. So, uh, so those are the kind of um, descriptions of the apps themselves. We're not gonna actually look into how they're used or anything. We're just gonna kind of compare the results. These are the, uh, these are uh, cropped images at least of the actual photos I fed to the apps. So this is uh, again, looking at Forbes with the floral characters. So a very um, classic set of prairie plants. Then we also used the same plants when we did, when we could to uh, feed in vegetative characters for um, a variety of, of these plants. Some of these are really not very good photographs. Um, some of them are examples of kind of non-typical types of these plants. So very challenging set. Um, then we also looked at um, grasses with the floral characters. Again, these are the exact pictures, they're cropped, but these are the pictures I fed into the apps. Um, and so um, that's uh, what we're working with, with um, floral characters. And then we also looked at the collars, took pictures of the collars, and also a picture of reed canary grass as a clump. So um, these are vegetative grasses. And these are the three seedling identification pictures I took. So um, pretty tough. Uh, so Rotibita pineda, uh, Rebecca herda, and Zizia aria. So um, let's take a look. How did these, um, how did these apps do? So generally speaking, so the first one um, was the Forbes with flowers. Um, and this is definitely the category where you got the best results. Um, there were no instances of serious management blunders, which is good. Um, their uh, Google Lens did not do a very good job with uh, management blunders, definitely identified natives as invasive sometimes. Um, but a lot of the a lot of the apps did fairly well um, in this category, um, with the exception of Seek. Um, so here's another thing to think about here. So when I have a correct 33% and incorrect zero uh, percent, what that's uh, telling us is that um, Seek did not give us an answer um, if it wasn't uh, sure. So. Um, same with Flora Incognita, is that uh, if you gave it a photograph, it wasn't able to identify the species, it did not give an answer. So, so that, that result was technically incorrect. So, or it was technically correct because there was no attempt at, uh, at identification. So 
So that'll, that'll make uh, some sense when we kind of summarize things at the end. So looking at Forbes with uh, without flowers, just vegetative, um, started to break down. Um, some did much better than others. Picture this, definitely got all of them um, compared to plant snap, which got none of them. I will say that plant snap only allows you to take five pictures per day. Um, and so I was only able to get two days of this in. So we we're, we're looking at a smaller subset for uh, plant snap, but um, so we're only looking at 10 species. Um, but it did not do a very good job of those 10 species. Um, Deke did, do, did, did poorly, um, but as well as Google Lens, um, PlantNet got about, uh, got a little bit more correct than incorrect on this one. Leaf Snap did poorly, mostly incorrect. Um, or Incognita did pretty good here, 75% uh, correct, but nothing wrong. Um, management, serious management blunders. We found those with Google Lens and Plant Snap, where I believe this is a situation where um, they were identifying some native species as um, really um, toad flax, which is a very um, bad invasive species that is a lot on a lot of early detection rapid response um, lists. So, um, that's definitely a that would definitely trigger a destroy spray out situation where that would be a pretty pretty dumb thing to do um, if you were not actually dealing with an invasive species. So um, next, moving on to grasses with the floral characters, not very great. Um, picture this again, really doing quite well, but it does give us incorrect. Uh, answers. So it's not correct all the time. Whereas um, flora incognita is accurate only about 40% of the time, but it's not giving us the wrong answer. Uh, Zeke is not even, you know, we'll talk about Zeke later. Um, so here's grass with vegetative characters, similar deal. Um, you have some real management blunders going on. Um, this is mostly because they're um, missing the reed canary grass. Um, some of the ones that did not miss reed canary grass, um, just picture this. And um, the reason that Flora Incognita and Seek, which didn't attempt to um, identify the reed canary grass, the reason they did not get a management blunder is because it's assumed that if you don't get a result, you're still going to try to figure out what it is. So you're going to use other methods like, um, you know, grass keys or something like that. So, um, so you don't get penalized there for uh, not returning a result. Um, so uh, seedlings, nobody got anything. So that do not use plant ID apps to try to identify seedlings. You will get incorrect answers or no answers at all. That's uh, pretty straightforward, I think. So when we look at these uh, aggregated together, um, you know, we have picture this coming out really quite strong with uh, almost 80% of the photographs being identified correctly. Um, they did misidentify about a quarter of them. So that's not really a good thing when you're talking about management that might be, you know, fairly costly, plan ID mistake. Um, but certainly compared to some of these other ones, leaf snap, plant snap, Google Lens, um, those are wrong most of the time. So I think we can kind of, based on this, at least in the, the parameters that we did this test with, um, basically looks like we have a couple classes of, uh, of apps. So we have kind of this high accuracy, moderate confidence that picture this falls into. Um, 
it's very accurate, but it always gives an ID that suggests high confidence, even when it's wrong. So, so that means, you know, you're kind of, uh, at, it's at the whims of the app to know if you should trust it or not. Um, another sort of the flip side of that is this uh, moderate accuracy, high confidence um, category with Flora Incognita in that. So if Flora Incognita cannot um, identify the photograph that you give it, it won't return results or it will ask you for more photographs. So, and then it, once it does return a, a result, it will it quantifies the confidence level. So that really helps you um, have some confidence as well um, in, in that identification uh, result. PlantNet is similar in the sense that it quantifies confidence levels, um, but it got a lot of them wrong um, and it wasn't particularly accurate. But the, uh, the biggest class here were mostly inaccurate and uh, potential management blunder class with uh, LeafSnap, PlantSnap, and Google Lens. So those were wrong the majority of the time. And um, some of those times, if you were to rely on that, uh, because they don't give you confidence information, um, if you trust them, if you trust that app, then you come up with a situation where you miss uh, important invasive species or you uh, take uh, control action against native species. So, so those are pretty, to, it's hard to recommend those. Okay, so, so what was going on with Seek? I'm not totally sure. Um, it could be the way that we uh, looked at this um, data, this uh, photograph set having just one photo, it seems like um, Seek is more set up to take multiple photos in the field. So basically what happened with, is that it returned pretty much zero information classifications. So it was able to say this was a dicot or a monocot, which is not very helpful. Um, kind of limited its utility. So it wasn't wasn't really useful for the way that we set up this test. Okay, so what can we conclude from this non-scientific little, uh, little test here? Um, we want to know, are they accurate? Well, uh, picture this is quite accurate. Under the conditions we gave it, it was correct about 80% of the time, um, even with the vegetative stuff. Um, other plants, uh, other plant ID apps were not very good at non wildflower ID. So um, that's where they typically struggled was vegetative forbs and any kind of grass ID. Um, I did not even try sedges. Um, that's, uh, that's another another approach because I mean, Honestly, like I, I have a, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to give you a, a confident uh, ID on most of them. So I'm not going to try to test it against something I don't know. Um, so another question that we ask is, is, is there a difference between these apps? Yeah, there's definitely differences in quality and identification strategies. Um, generally speaking, it seemed like the science-based um, apps to, or the, Develop, the apps developed by science-based organizations typically included some measure of um, uncertainty. So that's very helpful for um, you know, making management decisions. So um, things like Florian Cognita, PlantNet, um, those two were, um, were good on that uh, account, even, even if they didn't necessarily uh, identify things most accurately. They typically, uh, they still they still give you a sense of the confidence of the identifications, which you would notice. I mean, so for example, PlantNet, we can go look at the the, the numbers. Um, it was incorrect forty one percent of the time, but it would tell you that you know 
those percentages of uh, accuracy were typically really low. So it would be like five, four percent confidence. So, you know, when it's that low, it's probably not something that you would want to um, trust. So um, having that uh, confidence information can really help. So, um, and then the last question, could these, uh, could relying on these entirely lead to poor management decisions? Um, yeah, it seems like, um, you know, if you miss a reed canary grass ID, if you um, misidentify uh, purple prairie clover as um, toad flax, um, those two things are going to be costly mistakes. So especially, um, you know, if you could catch a reed canary grass um, infestation really early on, that's uh, going to be a huge benefit. Um, and certainly you don't want to be destroying the plant populations that you spent a lot of money on to get established. So, um, so I think uh, these apps or um, they can be useful tools to um, kind of uh, come up with some things that you might want to look into. But uh, generally speaking, the uh, it's hard to um, it's hard to recommend them as uh, standalone botanical uh, authorities. So I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, with that, uh, I go, I'm going to uh, finish up here. Um, yeah, we already talked about uh, if you're uh, if you're out in the field, take a selfie, post it on our uh, Facebook page, or send it to Andy. Um, but uh, with that, I will uh, open it up to questions. So, does anybody have any questions? The last lecture for body and beginners. Uh, one question that came in talking about evaluation is, does that methodology um, work when you apply it to other CRP practices? I would say, I mean, so probably not. So the way that we uh, look, to, at least for that sort of quick and dirty approach that we talked about, sort of that one transect. So that really is probably only going to be a good idea for the long, narrow, prey strip layout. Um, you probably want to do multiple transects or um, modify your um, sampling methods to come up with a, a way to better represent the variation in um, larger CRP practices. Um, so the prey strips lend themselves very well to the that quick and dirty method. So um, the, I guess the answer is not really. Sounds good. I'm not seeing any other questions and we're pretty far over time. So we're probably gonna, unless there's anything burning in people's minds. Thanks, Justin. I think we'll go ahead and, and end this one.